It's so good to see y'all. I, I think I said it to about half the room. It's always this way. It's so funny. Uh, but the music really does draw people in. I've never uh, gotten over that it really does take more than five minutes to get from our driveway to here. And so um, I'm glad all of you have arrived. Everyone has made it here. Uh, we even saw some showing up like through the windows. That was cool. I like that. By the way, if you live in uh, off Clementine Court, you already know this, but if you live anywhere in Kennerly Peak and you need a fast pass, uh, the Halversons have a gate. You just make your way at home. Just walk right on through, right on out the back. They won't care, won't care. We are so glad that you're here. I am glad um, to get to be in worship and to kick off this Holy Week with y'all. I don't know if y'all remember or realize, it's been a year ago now, but um, for those who are keeping score, this is the very first Palm Sunday we've ever had in our building. But it is the second Palm Sunday that we've celebrated as a church family, right? Because there was this thing that showed up and killed March Madness and ultimately took away our Palm Sunday and our Easter services here in the building. We are so excited about our first Easter here. And a year later, here we are. Now we get to do it together. And so that's why we'll get the palm branches running through here. It'll be, it's going to be so good. I'm glad that y'all are a part of it. Worship together today. We'll have our, our fish fry on Thursday. You want to get involved in that. Friday, we'll worship on the other campus uh, for an evening outdoor service. It's going to be wonderful. And then Easter Sunday, next Sunday, we'll be, plan is to be outside because it's going to be a beautiful day. It's not going to be cold like Christmas Eve. It's going to be a beautiful day outside. And uh, folks who are still a little cautious about being in closed spaces, they should feel really good about being out there. So that's the week that's ahead of us. Let me tell you about yesterday. So yesterday, I ran a 6K. Now, normally, organizations, when they're putting these runs together, they do a 5K or a 10K because a 5K equals like roughly three miles and a 10K is roughly six miles, right? But I ran a 6K, and this is why, because as you know, I have a six-year-old. Uh, sometimes he, he's out of line, he's up on the platform. That six-year-old, when given the option of a 1K or a 5K, chose the 5K for us. I asked him, have you ever run three miles before? Nope. Do you think we can do it? Yes. It's a color run. And so I think what got him excited was the color part of the color run. Because in the color part, you have like, you've been to these probably, they have powder and these little ketchup bottles, and they spray it all over you, unless you're him, and they take the lid off and they dump it on you. Because um, he wants it in his hair and on his body and all over his clothes that I wash later. So we had a 5K that he and I were going to run together. So it, it all started out pretty smoothly. We show up. They have breakfast available, some good coffee there. Not as good as Aaron's, but good nonetheless. And um, we get ready. I hear the microphone saying, it's time to start. So I look over. I see the starting line. And guess who's front in line? Kingston. Kingston's going to be first. I don't think that means he'll be first to finish. He just wants to be first to go. Maybe it's because all the cameras see the first people. I don't know what his thinking was. But he's in the front. And so I need to be with him because I promised I'd run with him. So we go to the front of the line. And there's some more garbled on the microphone. Apparently, the guy said, go. We didn't know that. Said, go. So these second, third, and fourth graders is what I identify them as. They, man, they take off sprinting. And they start yelling at the rest of us. He said, Go. Let's do it. Well, Kingston didn't have to tell him twice. So here we go. Kingston's running so fast. He's got this little bandana thing that's blown up over his eyes. He can't see where he's headed. I'm behind him, hoping sure he doesn't fall. Photos get taken. And just beyond the photo thing is where you're supposed to turn. You're supposed to turn. Because that's where the signs say to turn for, for the run. And so we're running, running. And remember, there's some second, third, and fourth graders who are leading the pack. They are old enough to read but not to follow instructions. And so we get to the line, and they just keep going down the sidewalk that's going towards the baseball fields. But I see these signs clearly saying that way. So I, as I'm jogging, I say to the adults, hey, this way or that way, follow them. <laughs> okay. It, it didn't take me long to realize we were going the wrong way. Be careful who you follow. <laughs> because we kept going. And we ended up running by the baseball field and back around the middle school building and up the way back to the front. We ended up at the starting line again. And then we hear the microphone saying, make sure and veer. I'm like, tell your volunteers. We're following their lead. Finally, we make the run. And again, Kingston, he ran some of it. it took us an hour. We're okay. Three miles in an hour. We came back really dirty and really glad that we had made the run. But as we were making that sort of 
thing around this way. I just, I said out loud at one point, I said, where are we going and why are we letting second, third, and fourth graders lead the way? Clearly they're lost. And I just kept saying to myself, you gotta be careful who you follow. You gotta be careful who you follow. Because sometimes the people that you're following are going places you do not want to go. Be careful who you follow. Just last week, we were talking about this. We were talking about the, the line, lead us not into temptation. We talked about how you can be led into places and things that you never intended to ever get to and you just kind of found yourself there and looked around and how how did I get here? Well, because you weren't paying attention to the prayer that you pray all the time, lead me not into temptation, and you just walked right back into it. But at the end of that line, there's a comma, and then it says, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, but before we get there, let me remind you where we've been, just real quickly. So the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that we all know, many of us know, we grew up saying it, it's the one touch point that might even draw us back to, oh yeah, that's right, I remember saying that. It begins with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember, the Holy One, the set-apart one, the one who we believe created all that is, says, you can call me Abba. You can call me Dad. We can be so intimately close. We can be so in love relationship that though I am bigger than you, I can be with you. And so we start the prayer with that intimate thing. And while we have God listening, and while God has drawn near, we start to say these other lines. Remember the other lines? Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We start asking God to make what's there, what we're waiting for, what we're working towards, happen now. The thing we long for more than anything is that his kingdom would come and it would be here and now. And then we say, hey, can you help provide what we need? We say daily bread and we really mean all things. Can you provide what we need today? Right, and we just, we just keep going, right? We talk about forgiving sins or trespasses or debts and that we need to be forgiving others those things as we expect and anticipate those things to be forgiven by God. And now we've got ourselves into this line and so now we're in this, this evil thing. Deliver us from evil. The word can also mean rescue us from evil. Now, this day, Palm Sunday, is a great day for us to be talking about this because this is essentially what the people in Jerusalem were shouting on Palm Sunday. You remember the story. It comes to us from, uh, from Matthew uh, 21 right here. It's the Palm Sunday story. I'm gonna read a part of it to you. As they approached Jerusalem, came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent disciples ahead saying, go to that village, get a donkey, a Right? So he goes to get the donkey, brings it back. I'm fast forwarding a little bit. This took place to fulfill what the prophet had said about daughter Zion. So your king comes to you gentle, riding on a donkey. Right? So he has the donkey. He's coming into town. The disciples go and do that. And in verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna! Now, this wasn't like Hosanna like we did for Tom Brady after he wins the Super Bowl, like just out in the streets cheering for the one who's claimed a victory over the Super Bowl, right? This is different because Hosanna is not just a, yay, go Patriots. Wait, he doesn't play for the Patriots anymore, <laughs> right? Anybody else figure that part out? Go Tampa. Who ever said that out loud? Like, seriously, go Buccaneers. Uh, they've never been in the playoffs until recently. All right, here we go. We're gonna just keep going. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What they were saying as they were waving their branches and throwing cloaks to the ground and shouting was, save us. Rescue us. That's what Hosanna means. It's not like a, yay, way to go. It's, hey, we need you. Come. Might you be the one that's gonna come and free us from the Roman oppression? Might you be the one that's gonna come and finally make all things right? Are you the one that's gonna make mountains low and valleys high? Are you gonna take the crooked roads and make them straight? Are you gonna be the one to do it? We believe you can. Come save us. Come rescue us. This is what they were shouting because they knew something wasn't right. Something had gone horribly wrong and they were waiting, longing for something, someone who could come and save them. And that's what they're shouting on this 
Palm Sunday, they believed, and many of us have come to believe, that when we say Hosanna to Jesus, he does come, he will come, and he will save us. But it still leaves us with some interesting questions, like questions that rise when you think about this Lord's Prayer. Remember, all the way along, it, it, every line, when you take it just by itself, it makes you think, oh, I better think about that when I pray that prayer. I need to investigate this a little bit more. And so, so this line, deliver us from evil, did he do it? I mean, the last time you looked around, have you seen evil? I have. I mean, even with rose-colored glasses on, you see evil. Evil is still very much alive and well and at work in this world of ours. It did not go away. In fact, it's still here. What exactly is it? Well, in the Eastern cultures, there's this, this, this idea of balance, right? It's a philosophical way of looking at things, that we know things are good because we've seen things that are bad. This makes sense? We know that things are high because we've seen things that are low. We know what rich is because we know what poor is. And so they, they carry this real balance sort of way of looking at things. And so some would say that we know good because we know evil. And to this point, what is evil? Anything that ain't good feels like evil to us. Things didn't go right. Things didn't go well. Someone caused harm to someone. Cancer. All of these things we lump into evil because they are not good, right? We know this. There's this good and evil thing at work. It's still here. So what are we going to do with it? Well, in, in Matthew 13, there's a parable. There's a parable that Jesus tells. He tells actually two kind of back to back, and it, it's the only parables that he describes, like, here's what I meant when I said that. You may remember the parable of the sower, where the, the, the seed that's being sown is the word of God. And the parable talks about how some of the seed is thrown on this kind of soil, and it grows really fast, but then withers because it didn't have roots. There's this other seed that gets thrown on this rocky ground. It was so hard and difficult that it wouldn't grow at all. There's this other soil that's really, really, really nice, and the seed hits it, and it grows, and it deep roots, and man, it lasts forever. So there's that parable, and then he goes and describes what he meant by it, right? The different ways that the word of God lands on the soil of our hearts. And I think that that parable is really great because it speaks to us and to the different kinds of soil that exist in our room. How do we receive the word of God? How do we receive the truth that we find in the scriptures? And then after that parable, he goes to the parable of the weeds. The parable of the weeds. You can almost forget that that's in there. Some of you may have never even heard of it. The truth of the matter is this parable of the weeds is a difficult word. And some of you at the end are gonna say, boy, pastor, I've never heard you go like hellfire brimstone before. I'm not. On the front end, I'm telling you, I'm not. I'm just gonna tell you what I read and just let it speak for itself, I promise you. I won't even like <laughs> stomp any of that stuff, spit, the things that you grew up with. I'm not gonna do any of that stuff, but I am gonna read the truth because I believe the word is truth. So in this parable of the weeds, let me read this parable to you. It's a, it's a very interesting one. Jesus told them another parable. This is after the sower one. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and they said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in that field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he says. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? No, he answers, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and then at that time, I'll tell the harvesters to first collect the weeds, bundle them to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Parable of the weeds. To me, sounds pretty straightforward. There's wheat that sounds like good stuff. You want the wheat. Then there's weeds, bad stuff you don't want with the wheat. But they coexist, they co-mingle, they live together. And at some point, at some point in time, at the end of time, the wheat will be preserved and the weeds will be burned. Just telling you what it said. 
the disciples hear this and they go, hey, I'm not sure we understand. Like, what, what are you trying to say here? Oh, glad you asked. But after they get this description, they may have wished that they had not asked for more of a description. <laughs> because then he goes on to explain this parable in verse 36, same chapter, 13. He left the crowd, went to the house. The disciples came and said, can you explain the parable to us? He says, okay, here's, here's the explanation. The one who sowed the good seed, that's the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. He continues. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They'll weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Peter, why'd you tell him to explain that? Wasn't it a little bit easier the first time he said it? Well, guys, I just thought it might be helpful. We'd know what we could say. We'd teach it to the other people. You think we're gonna teach that to the other people? You think preachers are going to get in good graces with folks as he starts reading this kind of story and telling people that in the room there are people who are wheat and weeds? You think get run out. Wait a second. You want us to tell people that at the end of all time there's going to be a reckoning? Like at the end of all time there's going to be people who are of the kingdom and there are going to be people who are not? It's like Jesus is saying, yep. Because that's the truth. The truth is at some point... In the future, there will come a time of harvesting. There'll come a time when the wheat is, and the weeds are. And I'm like, well, Jesus, you did talk about sheep and goats. You know, sheep are these people, goats are these people. It seems like this isn't just some random teaching of Jesus where he says, okay, in case you missed it, there is a reckoning. There is a moment when who's in, who's out does happen. But in the meantime, you're gonna live together. In the meantime, you're gonna try to work it out amongst yourselves. In the meantime, wheat people are gonna be interacting with weeds. But good news, weeds are gonna be hanging out with wheat. And we're gonna let the harvest grow. We're gonna let the harvest grow until it's time to harvest it. This is kind of a tough teaching, wouldn't you say? But it seems to be the truth. I mean, I'm reading it in the book that we call true. And I can't pick the parts that are easy to hear. In fact, at the very end of this, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear. It's like Jesus is saying, look, I know a lot of y'all are gonna start tuning me out because this is not the kind of thing you thought I was gonna say. This is not the kind of thing that you can put on, uh, put in a Max Lucado book. (laughs) This is tough. But he spoke to them kind of in a way that we could understand. Look at this. I mean, who likes these things? If you can't see from the back, it's a weed. I pull into my front driveway, and and my wife, if she happens to see the yard, and I've not tended to it recently, she'll go, oh, our yard looks horrible. I say, what do you mean? I just mowed it, I edged it, it looks great in my mind. I've got the bushes all hedged off, it's beautiful. The weeds are everywhere, they've gotten out of control. Been there? This field out here, if you look through the windows, it actually looks pretty good. Looks pretty good, but that's where this came from. I pulled it this morning. From a distance, the field always looks pretty good. But when you get up close, you see that there's weeds there. And for most of us, we don't like weeds. If you're a golfer, you pay good money to be a member of this club, and they spend really good money to make sure that when you're on that fairway or on that green, you don't see any of this. They make sure that those are the, some of the best fairways that you're gonna be able to find in this area and probably the best greens that you're gonna find in the state because they spend, like, there's a number of zeros at the end of this, friends. Like, I think there's six. To make sure that these don't grow amongst the goodness of the grass. 
If you play baseball, the last thing you wanna do is find these, unless you're like seven or eight and you're just learning the game, you wish there were flowers in the outfield, but they don't let those grow anymore. If you play football, you don't, none of us want these. You definitely don't wanna be one, right? Nobody wants weeds amongst the wheat, but in this world, it appears that they grow together. They grow side by side. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, we're gonna weed it out. Try to weed out the weeds. Kind of like a good old freshman English class. Try to weed them out. Get rid of the bad, find the good. Now, here's the first part of this. There's a lot of evil in the world that we can't really do a whole lot about. Or at least it feels like we can't. Like, while we sit here, there's children who are gonna die because they don't have any food. And there's children who are gonna be treated really harshly. They're gonna be harmed by adults who don't love them. There's gonna be things that happen in our world. There's gonna be wars of all kinds and famines and pestilence, all sorts of stuff that is not good. It's evil and it's here. And it's amongst us. But there is something we can do. There's gotta be something we can do. I mean, we've tried to throw money at it and that hadn't solved it. We tried to throw armies at it and that didn't solve it for sure. There's an evil that pervades and it lives right along the good. And, and even here in our church, the good and the evil live together. There, there was once a thought that if you went to church, if you came to the church, that's where you'd find all the wheat. And all the weeds are sleeping in. You ever slept in? I've slept in. Does that make me a weed? No. Wheat and weeds coexist all day long. And they are here, and they're in our community, and they're in our state, and they're in our country. They stay together, so what do we do about it? Well, the thing that we can do, that moms and dads tell their kids all the time, you can't take care of them, take care of you. Do your part. All right, here's our part. Collectively and individually, here's our part. I was talking about where I felt like this sermon was going, middle of the week, and Raph said, oh, it sounds like the baptism stuff. I said, what baptism stuff? And he like started to read it to me. It's like, oh, I don't say that at our baptisms. And I thought, ah, maybe I should because it's in the Methodist book of worship. But when someone who's old enough to proclaim Christ for themselves comes forward to be baptized, there's this covenant. And it begins with renunciation of sin and profession of faith. I've never used this. I've never spoken these words here. Maybe I should and maybe I will from now on. But at the very beginning, a person who wants to be baptized, an adult believer, a teenage believer, somebody who wants to say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I wanna live with him. I want him to, to be my partner. I wanna have him guide. I want him to be Lord. I want him to forgive me. The whole thing begins with me asking you, and I'm asking you now. You don't have to raise your hand. Just answer to yourselves. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, capital C, all, whole church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? Do you renounce the spiritual force of wickedness, turn away, give them up? Do you reject the evil powers of the world, refuse to accept them and repent, turn away from, feel remorse for the sin that's in you? And if you do, you would up here, say, I do. Or from where you sit, you might claim again, yeah, I do. And then I would continue. I would say, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms that they present themselves? And if you were here, and maybe there, you would say, I do. I accept that I have freedom and that I have power, that God's given me to be wheat and not weeds, to battle against weeds as I live my wheat life. You would say, I do. And then finally, I would say, do you confess Jesus Christ as your savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to all people of all ages, nations, and races? And if you confess Christ as your Savior and you want to put your whole trust in him, 
you would tell me here, or you might say it there, I do. You see, when you come to get baptized, you are essentially in the Methodist church, and actually from the earliest times of the church, we've adopted and adapted it from the early church, you would begin with this idea of saying, I know there's evil in the world, and I put my hand up against it. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. It's as if, it's as if God's saying, look, I'm giving you away. Renounce, resist, repent, follow. This is what we can do. And, it, and I find it interesting that in John 17, which is another place where Jesus prays, he prays first for himself, and then he prays for his disciples, and he prays for all believers. But in this little section where he's praying for the believers, the ones who would be following him, the disciples, he says this. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Even Jesus in his final prayer in Gethsemane, where they say in the other gospels, he was so tormented by the pain he was feeling that he was, it was like blood in his tears. He was so heartbroken, so, oh. Even in the midst of that prayer, he says, I'm not asking you, God, to take them out of the world. Protect them while they're in it. And so we keep praying. Deliver us. Rescue us. Protect us from evil. Until the day, God, when you come to do it for yourself. That's our prayer. You've been saying it for a long time. We just gotta pay attention to what we're saying. Let's pray together. God, if we're just absolutely true, we wish that evil didn't exist. We wish that evil wasn't in the world. We especially wish that evil was not something we had to be um, experiencing, participating in, watching. We wish God and pray God that in this world we live in now that, that evil would have no power and no authority. We know that you're all powerful and capable of, of wiping anything out that you would. And so God, we find ourselves curious as to why you allow good and evil to coexist in this great world of yours. God, we find hope, encouragement, and confidence to know that that there will be a day when you finally make all things right and you finally eradicate evil once and for all. So in the meantime, allow us to see evil as it is and to flee from it, to run from it, to avoid it, to warn others of it. God, we know by your power alone can we be rescued from it. So today, again, we give you our lives, asking that you would protect us from evil. In Jesus' name, amen.